Hey there. So I don't think I'm going to edit this uh, very much. You get the raw, uncut version of this, and it's going up on my personal channel because despite having some overlap with the kinds of stuff I talk about on the podcast, it's not especially produced. Um, so I just went back and rewatched the uh, CitizenCon video from a couple years ago where they described persistent entity streaming and the sort of graph database architecture underneath this. Um, and actually, one moment, please, let me pull up the, um, spectrum post that, and so I can get Chris Roberts response in front of me. One moment, please hold. There we go. Um, so yeah, so what's going on with the graph database? Um, and for why you should listen to me, I'm a software engineer, systems, architect, cybersecurity, whatever I do. Uh, a bunch of things with sort of like systems at scale. I worked for a company called Akamai for about uh, four years where I helped uh, deliver about a quarter of the traffic on the internet uh, in that era and have also worked for a couple other companies out here in the Valley, now run my own consultancy. So I've been doing things at internet scale for a while. Um, I've worked with, I'm pretty sure that CIG are using a software tool called Neo4j, a database called Neo4j, um, just based on the screenshots that were in the uh, CitizenCon presentation, which is like, it's great software. Uh, we used it on the security team at Lyft for uh, helping us understand and manage our AWS deployment, Amazon Web Services deployment. So like, um, I have some exposure to the tool. I've played around with it myself. Um, I know databases, I know internet things. So um, I'll be honest, I've like kind of been wanting to talk about this for a while because I watched this CitizenCon presentation. Uh, what was it called? Um, oh God. Sorry, I may need to, I really should cut some of this stuff out. Um, There we go, it's just called Server Meshing in the State of Persistence with, um, oops, their names, um, Paul Reindell and Benoit, sorry, Benoit, Paul and Benoit. Let's, let's go with that. Anyway, it's a great talk, and they get into the details on this in a way that I was genuinely really impressed by. So, like, just get that out there right up front. Um, the thing which surprised me at the time, and which continues to, I guess, I will say I'm not surprised that CRG are running into these issues, because I'll be honest, I don't know anybody else who uses a graph database, even a really good one like Neo4j, in the way that CRG are using this one. And so to give you a little bit of context on that, there are a bunch of different ways that you can think about databases, a bunch of different ways that you can use them, a bunch of different like jobs you can ask them to do. Uh, and uh, the way that graph databases are traditionally used in like a social network, for example, is that like every night there's a batch job that runs uh, and there's some other database, which is the source of truth for like who's following who. And we've got a batch job that runs at like you know, two in the morning uh, Pacific time. So uh, the East Coast isn't up yet. Uh, the West Coast has gone to bed. Um, very American centric view of the world, but roll with me. Uh, we've got a server, we've got a batch job that runs at two in the morning and it takes out the list, you know, that day's list of who's following who. Uh, and it loads that into a, a graph database. You have the social graph there. And then during the day queries, which are like, uh, who is following this person and should we deliver their, you know, notifications about their tweets to them, for example, uh, get sent in a read-only fashion using this uh, backend graph database, because it turns out um, graph structures are actually really hard for computers to deal with. Uh, the, especially even tree structures. Um, so like anything with a cycle in it, is particularly bad. Think about like which 
web pages link to which other web pages. Like if two web pages both link to each other, then you have a cycle in the graph um, and you have to account for that. Um, that's why like Google solves this problem at internet scale and have made it look easy. And so that's uh, maybe part of why people have stopped thinking that graph uh, problems are hard, but graph problems are really freaking hard for computers to deal with at scale. Um, there are a bunch of reasons for that with have names like cache locality. I'm not going to get into, just trust me on this, but um, they are. And so uh, we will usually solve them. We'll, we'll usually try to sort of like isolate the solving of these problems into a particular place. Uh, and we use graph databases to do that, but we will deal with all of the like, what's your name, what's your email address, what's your address, like what are all of your tweets in a more traditional sort of like table structure database. Um, and then every night we'll take a dump from the table structure database, we'll grab just the who's following who bit, we'll load that into a graph database and we'll use that during the day to make the, uh, you know, who's following who queries. Uh, and the, so the graph database can hyper optimize the queries that are really hard and around graph structure and the tabular databases can uh, handle the queries that are really big and have a lot of data involved with them around like moving large chunks of data and storing and managing large chunks of data. I'm oversimplifying massively. Anybody who's worked on the back end of these systems can, you know, can tell you about like, you know, 10 different kinds of databases that I haven't even touched on, but like, um, roll with me here. And so generally speaking, we're not running the, these tabular databases are, we'll call them online transaction processing workloads where the graph database is really about just like managing the graph workload. And what CIG are doing is they're using this graph database for the whole thing, at least as far as I took from the CitizenCon presentation. And as soon as I watched that a couple of years ago, I was both like really impressed uh, not sure they were going to be able to pull it off, and also a little bit daunted by the problem of doing this. Now, they're totally right in the video. They talk about some ways where it becomes super efficient because you can just like delete one edge, reparent it, uh, an aggregate of items to, or an, an aggregate of nodes to another part of the graph to move stuff around. Like, they're right that that is super performant, but um, I'm not aware of anybody else who is using a graph database in this like online transaction processing fashion. Uh, and they're doing like transactions over it. They talked about, you know, uh, certain kinds of moves requiring multiple steps within the graph database. And so you sort of batch them together into a transaction and so that they either all succeed or fail together because you don't want to wind up in an incomplete state where like you've been, your ship has been removed from one system, the system that you're leaving, but it hasn't been added back to the system that you're entering. And you wind up just not even physically in between those systems in the simulation of the game world, but like virtu you know, in, in the, the graph representation of the virtual world, just nowhere. Um, you, you can't come back from that, or it's very hard to come back from that. You have to do a lot of extra work t to uh, manage that. And so you really want to ensure that like you have things set up so that if your ship can leave one system, but it can't enter the new system, then you just wind up back in the system that you were uh, leaving from rather than winding up nowhere. You like virtually, like literally virtually nowhere. In you wind up somewhere in the memory of the computer, but uh, nowhere is sensible in the simulation of the game. So um, all of this is extremely important. The, like they bit off a really big problem uh, they like server or not server meshing persistent entity streaming rolled out. It was remarkably successful. Uh, I was very impressed that uh, it got working, but we see now, okay, um, they rolled out a new version of, I, I'm really, again, I'm like about 80% sure that it's Neo4j. Uh, they rolled out a new version of Neo4j and it's having some of these stability and quality of life uh, problems. Um, the like the reason I believe that they're having these problems is just straight up because there are no graph databases which are built to operate at this scale in an online transaction processing kind of workload. 
Uh, they just don't exist. Like they're one hundred percent right that Neo Four J is the best thing in the business, but just nobody else uses it in this fashion, where you have users actually connecting to it and making uh, a lot of changes to it uh, on a fairly short time scale. We really do only ever use it in this like big batch job at night. You know, load. Uh, what is it? Um, yeah, ETL, extract, transform, load. Extract this data from the database, transform it into a fashion the graph database can understand, load it into the graph database. And then um, they talk about uh, the replication of mirror databases for full redundancy being a culprit in the database lockup. It's like, yeah, um, these are really, replication is a really expensive process. Um, actually, it's, I'm not trying to toot, my own horn, but if you watch the uh, podcast that I did with uh, Zach Johnson about the time he took down Diablo II Resurrected, and it's like day two of lunch, uh, he talks about the interplay between the uh, replicas and the primary database server, the issues that they had there, like very similar. It's, it's very common for like trying to mirror a database uh, to, if you have a database server that is operating at like 80, 90% of the capacity of the underlying hardware, and you're like, oh, I know what will solve this problem, I'll add a replica. Uh, you know, the process of like streaming a copy of the data from the primary to the replica uh, takes a lot more than the spare 10 to 20% of the CPU that the primary has. And now you have two dead database servers rather than one like limping along database server. Um, so yeah, I continue to be impressed that this is working as nearly as well as it is. I just think that like uh, CIG are up against the limits of the available technology. I was looking at a list last night of other graph databases and there's like AWS has something called Neptune, which might just be their in-house, like slightly modified version of Neo4j. I, don't, I haven't looked at it closely. I, um, I strongly suspect that it's built also around this model of like, you know, lift and shift the like graph heavy part of the workload, uh, but not around a sort of like online uh, graph uh, workload. And there's like an Apache project uh, thing called Giraffe. Uh, again, uh, I think that it's also built around this model. Um, and now the flip side of this is that like, this makes total sense, like structuring these things as total sense makes makes total sense for all of the reasons that they laid out in the CitizenCon video. Um, this is just how graph, or this is just how game engines think about the world is in graphs, and it provides some really nice benefits for, you know, building something as big as they are uh, to be able to chunk it up uh, in this way with sort of like an arbitrary number of levels of nesting, because that's what's really hard for a traditional sort of table structured database to handle is, you know, if you have a fixed number of levels of nesting, you can have like, well, we have a table for the, you know, the solar systems, we have a table for the planets, and we have a table for like stations and points of interest on the planets. If you only like ever have three levels of nesting, then a table-based database is great for that. But because they want and I think need to have a sort of arbitrary level of number of levels of nesting to, you know, go, you know, in the same graph from like, you know, the Stanton system all the way down to the, you know, silencer on uh, your, uh, you know, rifle, like uh, to be able to capture that uh, depth uh, and the sort of arbitrariness of that, uh, where, you know, you can go deep in any uh, bit of the graph and move things around the way they want and need to move them around as like ships and things, um, you know, as, as you drive a rover into your, your constellation or as the constellation moves from system to system or as you move, you know, a, you know, rifle from inside the rover to, you know, outside the constellation. Like, um, it makes perfect sense. It's just an incredibly hard computer science problem. Uh, the problems start with things which are called cache locality, uh, which anybody who has done any serious systems programming has just now uh, winced at, uh, and they don't stop there. Um, so that's TLDR, um, both 
this all makes total sense from a systems perspective. Uh, folks are solving really hard problems. They do seem like it's great to know that whichever graph database they're using, they've got like the systems engineers on it. Um, I'm actually going to CitizenCon and would love to talk with some of the CIG engineers about this just because I love like talking about systems and thinking about systems. I don't think I'm going to solve any problems for them, but if you would like a rubber duck, uh, I will be your rubber duck. Uh, it's a uh, term in software where we like encourage people to explain their problem to a literal rubber duck uh, first after spending like 15, 20 minutes banking their head on it. This is like for interns, you know, uh, and things. Uh, like if you have a problem, bang your head on it for 15 minutes, go explain it to this literal rubber duck that we gave you at onboarding, and then come find me and I'll, you know, talk you through it. And so sometimes even when people come find me, I will serve as a, you know, rubber duck for them and just like ask, try to ask useful questions. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know anything more than basically what I've given you uh, here. But um, yeah, it's really wild. I've never seen somebody attempt this before. I'm very impressed. I'm a little bit daunted. And I, you know, uh, hugs and or beers to the CIG devs and the Neo4j folks working on this as you would like and as, you know, is appropriate. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, this is a, this is real. Um, and I hope y'all are able to like figure stuff out. And I am so, so curious what like tricks, you know, what, like what optimizations you find turn out to make the difference for this particular set of problems. Um, <sighs> graphs are just so hard, man. Like it's, there's really just like no way around some of this stuff. I like a friend of mine, uh, jokes that CIG have only like bitten off five of the hardest problems in computer science to solve all at once. Uh, and she's, she's right. Um, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a real thing. Um, so yes, best of luck to you all. Um, hugs and or bears, please let me know if, if you want a rubber duck to talk about stuff with, because I'm fascinated by this stuff. I think there's so much interesting stuff happening here. I like, have kind of nerd sniped myself on it. I just like, I want to, I want to like chew on these problems. I like a dog worrying a bone. Uh, so as you can probably tell, anyway, um, that's, that's what I got. This is, um, yeah, a software engineer, uh, explaining, uh, star citizens graph database woes are trying to, and, um, yeah, see in the verse and otherwise till next time. <laughs>